What's good, budget buds? We're back at it again. This time, we're doing a different type of video. I'm going to start a new series called Let's Talk, and it's going to be about each individual topic in cannabis growing and how it relates to each other over time. I'm going to start with watering. I'll probably move on to things like lighting, environment, genetics, etc., etc., and it'll build on each other. So today we'll talk about watering. There's a lot of stuff to talk about. We'll start with what's the most common mistake that newer new growers make. The most common mistake that new growers make is overwatering. There's a few simple steps we can take to really reduce the possibility of that being a problem, and we'll go over those right now. Um, one, aeration. Aeration enhances the airflow and oxygen, which benefits root growth, nutrient uptake, and the overall garden ecosystem, like promoting the growth of aerobic bacteria. Um, options for making your soil more airy and so that it's good for drainage and aeration, you can use things like perlite, organic matter, rice hulls, sand, cocoa core, and peat. Those are just some of the things that will improve your soil structure and help you with aeration. And number two would be drainage. So depending on which type of pot you're using, the type of pot you use is very important. If it's plastic, it should have plenty of drainage holes at the bottom, or those little air holes on the side of the air pots, lots of holes on the side. What that allows is air to move through your root system because your roots, unlike the top of the plant, don't do photosynthesis. Your roots do cellular respiration so it needs oxygen in order to metabolize these sugars and create energy for it to do tasks sorry so drainage it's very important to have drainage holes for me i personally suggest growing in fabric pots first fabric pots are much cheaper and they're so much lighter to move around i have some friends who are older or disabled so they can't lift a 20 pound pot but because you use fabric, this you can get much larger fabric pots for much lighter. And as long as you're using cocoa core, plenty of aeration like perlite, like I mentioned before, and like worm castings, ends up being light enough that you can move them around. Like someone who's disabled can probably move something that's like five pounds, but not something that's 20. That's kind of how I think about it. And they're much cheaper, much cheaper. We we're just talking about cellular respiration and airflow, right? It's really important to have airflow in your tent for both the plant and for the root zone. So oftentimes people forget about putting a fan at the bottom of the tent. What this allows is you're moving air and preventing stagnant areas as well as increasing the airflow through the root system and oxygen uptake and what we mentioned before, the nutrient uptake. The fourth thing to keep in mind is temperature. Temperature is arguably one of the most critical factors affecting the evaporation rates as temperature rises, the kinetic energy of water molecules increase and in, it also increases the amount of vapor that the air can hold. Temperatures over 70 degrees are best for evaporation. Anything below 85 is best for plants and veg. And around 75 degrees for flower. This is all in Fahrenheit. I think the conversions would be something like 21 or 20 to 27 ish for most of the time. I think around 20 to 25 for flower but i think you go up to 30 i think 30 is 85 30 is 85 i think in celsius something like that 29 35 haven't done the conversions in long time all right Whew. that was a lot to talk about we can finally talk about some types of watering there's three main options in watering there's drip top and bottom so drip top and bottom drip top and bottom so drip irrigation you use a little carrot or dripper and it drips little drips of water over time. It's very efficient for water, great for large scale, but for us home growers, we often don't have the time and the money to invest in a large system unless they're really cheap and we're really deep into the hobby. So I'm expecting most people who watch us as to be like new growers and at an entry level, you don't need drip irrigation to succeed. So I'm not going to touch on that topic as much anymore just know it's really good for large scale and super efficient 
top watering. Top watering is the basic watering technique that everybody uses. You just take a can, you pour the water on top of the soil, and it drains downward. This is great for things like organic amendments. If you're using organic amendments, you often top dress them. So this dry powder that exists on the top layer of your soil doesn't really spread out, but if you use water, you can kind of water it in and it kind of filtrates down into the deeper parts of the medium and allows you to get a more homogenized soil instead of having hot spots in the soil. So top watering is very important also helps break down those nutrients so top watering is very important for organic growing bottom watering is in my opinion the best for new growers but relying on bottom watering can be difficult when you get plants that are multiple pounds like if you get plants that take up the entirety of a two by four you're not going to want to move it up and down if you have a trellis system you can't really bottom water as easily you're going to have to have a saucer and you're going to have to water the bottom of the saucer and you're going to basically measure the amounts that you water from the bottom. Uh, bottom watering is generally really good for a flood and drain system. If you have a large tray with lots of pots with like little holes on the bottom, you can flood the entirety of the tray. The plants will drink it up and then you drain it and that allows the plants to have a dry back system. And because of how water works, it wicks upward and there's capillary action. So, yeah, that's not important. But I didn't want to get too deep in that topic. What we mainly want to focus on is understanding more reality, more real terms. Because I could just touch on all these things and it's not going to help you. You're going to hear like 20% of the volume of the container and that doesn't really help a new grower. What helps is you're going to want to take something like a three gallon container of dry soil you want to water in roughly I don't know like if you have a three gallon pot you're going to do around two liters and as soon as you fill up the entirety of the soil with water it will start draining out the bottom when you've hit that amount you know you should feel the pot you should feel the weight what's important is the weight of the pot the texture of the soil and these two key factors can help new growers learn what fully saturated is and as the days progress when your plants grow and growing you'll notice the pot get lighter and lighter and that's when you can water if your pot doesn't dry back within two days you're watering too much or you don't have enough of one of the things mentioned above the aeration drainage uh, temperature or airflow one of those things are off you want your plants to be able to dry back honestly every 24 hours that's what I aim for um, the more irrigation cycles you can fit in into your grow, the faster they grow. So what I'm trying to explain is overwatering is a big issue, but if we take all the steps mentioned above, the perlite, the cocoa core, the worm castings, all three of those are very nice and airy. We're going to use fabric pots. You can water every single day, but if you're using a plastic pot that's oversized and your plants are small, your temperatures are cold, there's no airflow in the bottom of your tent, no fan, you probably won't be watering except for like every four or five days. But what that does is A, you have a high chance of overwatering because overwatering is more of an issue of lack of oxygen in the root system. It's not a I have too much water, I'm drowning thing. It's a lack of oxygen so when we look at hydro growers their roots are straight up in water that's fine but if you look at these hydro growers you'll notice there's air stones air pumps or something circulating oxygen into the water and that's what's making the plant not get anaerobic bacteria or fungus or bad growth so in general anaerobic bacteria is bad and aerobic is good in general You'll smell it if it's bad too. I think Epic Gardening talks about it really well when they're like composting. If your compost smells good, then you're doing it right. If your compost smells bad, then there's something off and you need to work on your process. But at this point, we've talked about saturation level. Uh, if you have a, I'll talk about it again. If you have a three gallon pot, two liters should be enough. A five gallon pot, about one gallon of water should be enough. 
it's gonna be 20% of the volume. You can do some math on it if you need. That should be enough to fully saturate your pot from pretty much bone dry. And I generally would not suggest watering more than 20% of the volume of the container. So if you have like a, a container that's four cups or five cups, you should do 20% of that. So it could be as low as like 0.8 or one cup or something. But keep in mind guys, you wanna familiarize yourself with the weight of the pot and the texture of the soil. Because over time it will get lighter and lighter and you'll know to water when it's light. And it's, it sounds really, really uh, old fashioned and not very scientific, but if you were to go on Google to look it up, what's the best way to, to know when to water? A lot of times they'll tell you either stick your finger in it for the first like few inches and if it's dry down to here or up to here, then it's grip bad or dry that four inches down, it's bad or you can lift the pot. Those are the two most commonly told ways to measure water moisture in your soil. Those little measuring tools, those water measuring tools for your soil, those soil testers generally are bad. You, If you're using one of those, I understand it's kind of like a meat thermometer and you're trying to use it as like a general guide, but most of the times they are not accurate you can't leave them in there because it causes rust on the metal strip that's on the tester. If you leave it in moist soil over time, it will break down and it will be bad at testing moisture and it's going to be leaching metals into your soil at the same time. So not great. Um, remember, if you're going to use those, to use them and then take them out and then use them. Don't leave them in and just be like, oh, that's good enough for me. Yep. Good little tip there. I think that should cover it on honestly for watering. If you figure out what the most it can be and you feel that weight, you'll know what it means when it's not that weight and to get it back to that amount. And the 20% rule is pretty good. You can go 15 if you're trying to go lighter. If you're using a plastic pot, maybe go 15. If you're using fabric, definitely go 20. So keep those things in mind. So the type of the pot, the temperature, the airflow, the soil composition for aeration, important factors. Alrighty guys, hopefully you learned something about watering and I didn't bore you too much. Hopefully I covered the, all the topics decently well. I'll do a deeper dive on the amounts and dry back cycles and irrigation cycles in a different video. This is a more introductory level video so we can talk about learning how to water a plant. Thank you guys. Peace, peace.